Today we want to look at the sum product problem. So for the past few lectures, we've been discussing the structure of sets under the addition operation. Today we're going to throw in one extra operation, right, so multiplication, and understand how sets behave under both addition and multiplication. And the basic problem here is, can it be the case that A plus A and A times A which is analogously the set of all pairwise products of elements from A, can these two sets be simultaneously small? Right, so the same for some single A, um, can we have it so that a plus A and A times A are simultaneously small. For example, it's easy to make one of them small. We've seen examples where if you take A to be an arithmetic progression, then A plus A is more or less as small as it gets. But for such an example, you see A times A is pretty large. It's actually not so clear how to prove how large it is. Uh, and, and there are some very nice proofs, and this problem has actually been more or less pinned down. But the short version is that A times A has size close to its maximum possible. So it turns out the size of A times A is almost quadratic. Um, okay, so this number is actually now known fairly precisely. So this problem of determining the size of A times A for the interval one through n is known as the Erdős multiplication table problem. Right. Uh, so if you take a n by n multiplication table, how many numbers do you see in the table? Okay, so that uh, turns out to be subquadratic, but not too subquadratic. Okay, so this answer has been, so this problem has been more or less solved by Kevin Ford, and we now know a fairly precise expression. But I don't want to so focus on that. That's not the topic of today's uh, lecture. This is just an example. Right? Alternatively, you can take A times A to be quite small by taking A to be a geometric progression. Then it's not too hard to convince yourself that A plus A must be fairly large in that case. Right? The geometric progression doesn't have so much additive structure. So A plus A will be large. And so can you make A plus A and A times A simultaneously small? And so it is conjectured that the answer is no. And this is a famous conjecture in this area known as the Erdős similarity conjecture. On um, the sum product problem, which states that for all finite sets of real numbers, Either A plus A or A times A has to be close to quadratic size. Okay, so that's the conjecture. It's still very much open. Um, today I want to show you some progress towards this conjecture via some partial results. And it will use a nice combination of uh, tools from graph theory and incidence geometry. So it nicely ties in together many of the things that we've seen in this course so far. Uh, so Erdős and Semmerady proved some bound which is like one plus C for some constant C. So today we'll show some bounds for somewhat better Cs. Um, okay, so you'll see. The first tool that I want to introduce is a result from graph theory known as the crossing number inequality. Okay. So you know that planar graphs are graphs where you can draw on the plane so that the edges do not cross. And there are some famous examples of non-planar graphs like K5 and K33. But you can ask a more quantitative question. If I give you a graph, how many crossings must you have in every drawing of this graph? 
And the crossing number inequality provides some estimate for such a quantity. So given the graph G, going to know by CR, so crossing of G, to be the minimum number of crossings in a planar drawing of G. There's a bit of subtlety here where by planar drawing, do I mean using line segments or do I mean using curves? It's actually not clear how that affects this quantity here. That's a very subtle issue. So for planar graphs, there's a famous result that more or less says if a planar graph can be drawn using continuous curves, then can be drawn using straight lines. But the minimum number of crossings, the two different ways of drawings, they might end up with different crossing numbers. But for the purpose of today's lecture, we'll use a more general notion, although it doesn't actually matter for today which one we'll use. So planar drawing using curves. Okay, so draw the graph where edges are continuous curves. How many crossings do you get? A crossing is a pair of edges um, that cross. Okay, you can ask a pair of edges that cross or a point that can, okay. it doesn't matter. So there are many different subtle ways of defining all these things. They won't really come up for today's lecture. The crossing number inequality is a result um, from the 80s, which give you a lower bound estimate on the number of crossings. So if G is a graph with enough edges, so the number of edges is, let's say, at least four times the number of vertices, then the crossing, the number of crossings of every drawing of G is at least the number of edges cubed divided by the number of vertices squared, and there's an extra constant factor, which, you know, it's a sum constant. constant does not depend on the graph. So in particular, if it has a lot of edges, then G, every drawing of G must have a lot of crossings. Okay. Okay, so the crossing number inequality was proved uh, by two separate independent works, one by Aitai, Huato, Newborn, Semeredi, and the other by Tom Layton, our very own Tom Layton here. Um, okay, so let me first give you some consequences of this theorem just for illustration. So if you have an n-vertex graph with a quadratic number of edges, then how many crossings must you have? Well, you plug in these parameters into the theorem, see that it has necessarily n to the fourth crossings. Well, if you just draw the graph in some arbitrary way, you have at most n to the four crossings because a crossing involves four points. Okay, so when you have a quadratic number of edges, you must get basically the maximum number of crossings. The leading constant for term factor is an interesting problem, which we're not gonna get into. Let's prove the crossing number inequality. First, the so the base case of the crossing number inequality is when you can draw a graph with no crossings. Right? And those are planar graphs. So for every connected planar graph, if it has at least one cycle, and you'll see why in a second why I say this, if um, so with at least one cycle, so that's not a tree. We must have that three times the number of faces is at most two times the number of edges. Okay, so here we're gonna use the key tool being Euler's formula, which we all know as the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces equals to two. We're here for face, means I draw, okay, I draw a planar graph, and so I count the faces, 
here there are two faces, outer face, inner face, count edges and vertices, so you have Euler's formula up there. And plug in Euler's formula for a planar graph with at least one cycle, okay, so we can obtain this consequence over here, because every face is adjacent to at least three edges. If you go around the face, you see at least three edges, and every edge is counted exactly twice. It's uh, adjacent to exactly two faces. Okay, so you do the double counting, you get that inequality up there. Um, okay, so plugging these two into Euler gives you that inequality up there. Um, sorry, no, plug it in, sorry. plugging these two into Euler, we get, we get that the number of edges is at most three times the number of vertices minus six. Um, so, so, so this leads to that inequality, but plug it into Euler, you get, you get, uh, plug in this into Euler, you get this. So, we have that the number of edges is at most three times the number of vertices for every graph G. So here we're required that the graph is planar and has at least one cycle, but even if we drop the planar, even if we drop the condition has at least one cycle, but just require that it's planar, every graph G satis every planar graph G satisfies this inequality over here. Okay, so in other words, in fact, you might have heard before, in a planar graph, the average degree of a vertex is at most six. So in particular, the crossing number of a graph G is positive if the number of edges exceeds three times the number of vertices. So it's not planar, so it has at least one crossing in every drawing. And by deleting an edge, from each drawing, from each crossing, we get a planar graph. Okay, you draw the graph, you have some crossings, you get rid of an edge associated with each drawing, then you get a planar graph. Um, well, you look at this inequality and you account for the number of edges that you deleted, we obtain then the inequality that the number of edges minus the number of crossings is at least three times the number of vertices. So, we obtain the inequality that lower bounds the number of crossings as the number of edges minus three times the number of vertices. So this one, um, yeah. Okay, so that's some lower bound on the crossing number. It's not quite the bound that we have over there. And in fact, if you take a graph with a quadratic number of edges, this bound here only gives you quadratic lower bound on the crossing number. It's some lower bound, but it's not a great lower bound. And we would like to do better. So here's a trick that this is a very nice trick where we're going to use this inequality to upgrade it to a much better inequality and to bootstrap it to a much tighter inequality. And so this involves a use of the probabilistic method. Let me denote by P some number between zero and one to be decided later. And starting with a graph G, Let's let G prime, with edges being uh, vertices and edges being V prime and E prime, be obtained from G by randomly deleting some of the edge, some of the vertices. 
or rather randomly keeping each vertex with probability p independently for each of these vertices. So you have some graph G. I keep each vertex with probability p, and I delete the remaining vertices. And I get a smaller graph. I get some induced subgraph. And I would like to know what can we say about the crossing number of the smaller graph in comparison to the crossing number of the original graph. Well, for the smaller graph, because it's still a planar graph, right? so G prime, oh, sorry, it's, it's still a graph, it's not, not a planar graph, it's still a graph, so G prime still satisfies this inequality up here. Right? So G prime still satisfies that the number of crossings in every drawing of G prime is at least the number of edges of G prime minus three times the number of vertices of G prime. But now note that G prime is a random graph. G was fixed, given. G prime is a random graph. So let's evaluate the expectation of both quantities, left-hand side and right-hand side. If this inequality is true for every G prime, the same inequality must be true in expectation. Now, what do we know about the expectations of each of these quantities? The number of vertices in expectation, that's pretty easy. So this one here is p times the original number of vertices. The number of edges is also pretty easy. Each edge is kept if both endpoints are kept. So this expectation on the number of edges remaining it's also pretty easy to determine. The crossing number uh, of the new graph, well, that I have to be a little bit more careful of because when you look at this smaller graph, maybe there's a different way to draw it that's not just deleting the sum of the vertices from the original graph. So even though the original graph might have a lot of crossings, when you go to a subgraph, maybe there's a better way to draw it but we just need an inequality in the right direction. So we are still okay. And I claim that the crossing number of G prime is in expectation at most P to the fourth times the crossing number of G because if you keep the same drawing, then the expected number of crossings that are kept, right, so each crossing is kept if all four of its endpoints are kept. So each crossing is kept with probability p to the fourth. So certainly you can draw it in expectation with this many crossings. Maybe it's much less, maybe there's a better way to draw it, but you have an inequality going in the right direction. Okay. Looking at that inequality up there in yellow, we find that the crossing number of g is at least p to the minus 2 e minus p uh, 3 p to the minus 3 p. And this is true for every value of p between 0 and 1. So now you pick a value of p that works most in your favor, and it turns out uh, you should do this by setting these two quantities to be roughly equal to each other. So, so setting P between zero and one so that um, four times the, well, okay. yeah, so basically set these two terms to be roughly equal to each other. Um, and then we get that this quantity here is at least the claimed quantity, which is e cubed 
over v squared up to some constant factor, which I don't really care about. In order to set p, I have to be a little bit careful that p is between 0 and 1. If you set p to be 1.2, this whole argument doesn't make any sense. So, uh, so this is okay. So, okay. So meaning p is at most 1, as long as e is at most 4 v. I mean, the 4 here is not optimal, but if 4 were 2, then it's not true, right? So if e is 2v, you can have a planar graph, so you shouldn't have a lower bound on the crossing number. Okay, so this is the proof of the crossing number inequality, which says that if you have lots of edges, then you must have lots of crossings. Any questions? Okay, so let's use the crossing number inequality to prove a fundamental result in incidence geometry. So incidence geometry is this area of discrete math that concerns fairly basic sounding questions about incidences between, let's say, points and lines. And here's an example. Um, so what's the maximum number of incidences between endpoints and end lines? Where by incidence, I mean if P, so curly P is a set of points, and curly L is a set of lines, then I write I of P and L to be the number of pairs, one point, one line, such that the point lies on the line. So I'm counting incidences between points and lines. You can view this in many ways. You can view it as a bipartite graph between points and lines, and we're counting the number of edges in this bipartite graph. Okay, so I give you n points, n lines. What's the maximum number of incidences? It's not such an obvious question. Um, so let's see how we can approach this question. Um, but first, let me give you some easy bounds, right? So, so here's a trivial bound. Okay, so here I want to know if I give you some number of points, some number of lines, what's the maximum number of incidences? So a trivial bound is that the number of incidences is at most the product between the number of points and the number of lines. So one point, one line, and most one incidence. Okay, so that's pretty trivial. We can do better. Yeah, so we can do better because, well, you see, let's use this following fact that every line, um, so every pair of points determine at most one line. I have two points. There's at most one line that contains those two points. Using this fact, we see that the number of, um, so let's count the number of triples involving two points and one line. such that both points lie on the line. Okay, so how big can this set be? So let's try to count it in two different ways. On one hand, this quantity is at most the number of points squared, because if I give you two points, then they determine this line. So it's at most number of points squared. But on the other hand, we see that if I give you a line, I just need to count now the number of, okay, so if 
and they also require that these two points are distinct. Right? So if I give you a line, I now need to count the number of pairs of points on this line. Right? So I can enumerate over lines and count line by line how many pairs of points are on that line. So I get this quantity over here. On each line, I have that contribution. And now using Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, right, we find that you know, this squared term is at least the number of incident incidences divided by the number of lines. And the remaining minus one term contributes just to the number of incidences. Okay, so the first is by Cauchy-Schwartz. Right, so putting these two inequalities together, we get some bound, some upper bound on the number of incidences, but you have to invert this inequality you will get that the number of incidences between points and lines is upper bounded by the number of points times the number of lines raised to power one half plus the number of lines. So that's what you get from this inequality over here. By considering point line duality. So you, whenever you have this kind of setup involving points and lines, you can take the projected duality and transform the configuration into uh, lines into points and points into lines and the incidences are preserved. So I also have an inequality. So by duality, I also have an inequality where I switch the rows of points and lines So I is already the number, so I don't need to put an extra absolute value signed. Um, so the number of points and lines is upper bounded by the number of lines times the square root of the number of points plus an extra term just in case there are uh, very few lines. Okay, so these are the bounds that you have so far. And the only thing that we have used so far is the fact that Every two points determine at most one line, and every two lines meet at, at most one point. Um, okay, so these are the bounds that we get. And in particular, for n points and n lines, we get that the number of incidences is big O of n to the three halves. This should remind you of something we've done before. So in first part of this course, when we were looking at extremal numbers, where did three halves come up? Like C4. C4, yeah. So if you compare this quantity to the extremal number of C4, it's also n to the three halves. And in fact, the proof is exactly the same. All we're using here is that the incidence graph is C4 free. Right? So in fact, this is an argument about C4 free graphs. Right? So this fact here of every two points determine the most one line. It's saying that there's no, if you look at the incidence graph, there's no C4. Okay, so that's all we're using for now. Any questions? All right. So is this the truth? Now, Back when we were discussing the extremal number for C4 free graphs, we saw that, in fact, this is the correct order. And what was the construction there? Okay. So the construction also came from incidences. But incidences of taking all lines and points in the finite field plane. Fq squared. If you look at all the lines and all the points in a finite field plane, then you get the correct 
uh, lower bound for C4. But now we are actually working in the real plane. So it turns out that the answer is different when you're not working in the finite field. We're going to be using the topology of the real plane. And we're going to come up with a different answer. So it turns out that the truth for the number of maximum number of incidences in the plane for points and lines in the real plane is not exponent 3 halves, but turns out to be 4 thirds. And this is a consequence of an important result in incidence geometry, a fundamental result known as the Semiradi Trotter theorem. Similarly, Trotter theorem says that the number of incidences between points and lines is upper bounded by this function where you look at the number of points times the number of lines and each raised to power two thirds. And plus some additional terms just in case there are many more lines compared to points or way more points compared to lines. Okay, so that's the similarity Trotter theorem. And as a corollary, you see that n points, n lines, give you at most n to the 4 thirds incidences. Right, in contrast to the setting of the finite field plane, where you can get n to the 3 halves incidences. So somehow we have to use the topology of the real plane for this one. And I want to show you a proof. So it turns out not the original proof, but there's a proof that uses the crossing number inequality to prove similarity Trotter theorem. And you see in crossing number inequality, we are using the topology of the real plane via where? Euler's formula, right? So at the very, big, very beginning, Euler's formula has to deal with the topology of the real plane. Now this bound turns out to be tight. So let me give you an example showing that the four thirds exponent is tight. Um, and the example is if you take P to be this rectangular grid of points. Okay, so rectangular grid of points, and L to be a set of lines. So I'm going to write the lines by their equation, where the slope is an integer from 1 through k, and the y-intercept is an integer from 1 through k squared. And you see here that every line in uh, L contains exactly k points from P, so we get in total K to the four incidences, which is on the order of N to the four thirds. So N to the four thirds is the right answer. Okay, so now let me show you how to prove similarity Trotter theorem from the crossing number inequality. It turns out to be a very neat application. It's almost a direct consequence once you set up the right graph. And the idea is that we are going to uh, draw a graph based on our incidence configuration. Right. So first, just to clean things up a little bit, let's get rid of um, get rid of lines in L with one or zero points in P. So this operation doesn't affect the bounds. So you can check uh, you know, these lines, they don't contribute much to the incidence bound and only contributes to this plus L. So you can get rid of such lines. So let's assume that every line in L contains at least two points from P. And 
let's draw a graph based on this incident structure. So if I have So suppose okay, so suppose these are my points and lines. I'll just draw a graph where I keep the points as the vertices. And I put in an edge if it's a finite edge that connects that that's connects two adjacent points on the same line. So I get some graph. Um, let me make this graph a bit more interesting by doing OK, good. So I get some graph. And how many crossings and nodes does this graph have? So the number of crossings of G is at most the number of lines squared because a crossing comes from two lines. Okay, so here you have a crossing. A crossing comes from two lines. The number of crossings is the most the number of lines squared. On the other hand, we can give a lower bound to the number of crossings from the crossing number inequality. Um, and to do that, I want to estimate the number of edges. And this is the reason why I assume every line contains at least two points from P. Uh, it's because a line with you now K incidences gives K minus one edges. And if k is at least 2, then k minus 1 is at least k over 2, let's say. I don't care about constant factors. So by crossing number inequality, the number of crossings of g is at least the number of edges cubed over the number of vertices squared, which is at least um, the number of incidences of this configuration cubed over the number of points squared. Right? So number of vertices is the number of points. And the number of edges by this argument here is on the same order as the number of incidences. Putting these two facts together, so we see, uh, oh, OK, there was one extra hypothesis in crossing number inequality. Right? So provided that this hypothesis holds, which is that the number of incidences is at least eight times the number of uh, points. So, so that the original hypothesis holds. Okay, so putting everything together, um, you know, rearranging all of these terms and using upper and lower bounds on the crossing number, we find that the number of incidences is upper bounded by, well, the main term you see is just coming from these two. But there are a few other terms that we should put in just in case this hypothesis is violated and also to take care of this assumption over here. So adding a couple of linear terms corresponding to the number of points and the number of lines. So, so that if this hypothesis is violated, then the inequality is still true. Okay. So this proves the crossing numbers inequality. Any questions? All right. So we've done this, these two you know, very neat results. But questions, what do they have to do with the sum product problem? So I want to show you how you can 
give some lower bound on the sum product problem using similarity Trotter theorem. So it turns out that the sum product problem is intimately related to the incidence geometry. And the reason, well, you'll see in a second precisely why they're related. But roughly speaking, when you have addition and multiplication, well, they are kind of like taking you know, slope and y-intercept of an equation of a line. So there are two operations that are involved. So turns out many incidence geometry problems can be set up in a way, uh, so many sum product problems can be set up in a way that involves incidence geometry. And a very uh, short and clever lower bound to the sum product problem was proved by Alakesh in the late 90s. So he showed the bound that if you have a subset, a finite subset of reals, then the sum set size times the product set size is at least a to the five half. So you put, as a corollary, one of these two must be fairly large. The max of the sum set size and the product set size is at least a to the 5 fourth. Okay. Let me show you the proof. I'm going to construct a set of points and a set of lines based on the set A. And a set of points in R2 is going to be pairs x comma y, where the horizontal coordinate lies in the sum set A plus A, and the vertical coordinate lies in the product set A times A. And a set of lines is going to be these lines, Y equals to A times X minus B, or actually let me say X minus A prime, where A and A prime lie in A. Okay, so these are some points and some lines. And I want to show you that they must have many incidences. So what are the incidences? So note that the line Y equals to A times X minus A prime, it contains the points A prime plus B and AB, which lies in P for all B in A. Okay, so you plug it in. You plug in A prime plus B into here, you get AB. And this point lies in P because the first coordinate is in the sum set. The second coordinate lies in the product set. So each line in L contains um, many incidences. Right? So each line in L contains A incidence. So this line, so each line in L contains A incidences. Um, also, we can easily compute the number of lines and the number of points. The number of points is a plus a size times size of a times a, and the number of lines is just the size of a squared. So by similarity trotter, we find that the number of incidences is lower bounded by noting this fact here. We have many incidences. So the number of lines, each line contributes A incidences. But we also have an upper bound coming from the similarity Trotter theorem. So plugging in the upper bound, 
we find that you have, so now I'm just directly plugging in the statement of Samuel Trotter. The main term is the, the first term. You should still check the latter two terms, but the main term is the first term. Um, okay, so now plugging in the values for P and L, we find This is the case, plus some additional terms, which you can check are dominated by the first term. So let me just do a big O over there. Okay, now you put left and right together, and we could obtain some lower bound on the product of the sizes of the sum set and the product set, thereby yielding Alakesh's bound. So this is some lower bound on the sum product problem. And you see, we went through the crossing number inequality to prove similarity trotter, a basic result in incidence geometry, and viewing sum product as an incidence geometry problem, one can obtain this lower bound over here. Any questions? I want to show you a different proof that was found later that gives an improvement and um, here's a question, can you do better than, than 5 fourth? Okay, so it turns out that there was a very nice result of Shoi Moshi sometime later that gives you an improvement. Shoi Moshi proved in 2009 that if A is a subset of positive reals, then the size of A times A multiplied by the size of A plus A squared is at least the size of A to the four divided by four ceiling log of the size of A, where the log is base two. Okay, so don't worry about the specific constants. Um, A being in the positive reals is no big deal because you can also, you can always separate A as positive and negative and analyze each part separately. So as a corollary to Shoi Moshi's theorem, we obtain that for A, a subset of the reals, the sum set and the product set, at least one of them must have size at least A raised to four thirds divided by two times log base two size of A raised to one third. So, so basically A to the four thirds minus little old one in the exponent. Okay, so better than before, and this is a new bound. I want to note that in this formulation where we're looking at uh, lower bounding this quantity over here, this is tight up to logarithmic factors. By considering A to be just the interval from one to N, right? So if A is the interval from one to N, then the left-hand side, A plus A is around size N, so you have N squared, and A times A is also, I mentioned, around size N squared. So so this inequality here is tight. The consequence is not tight, but the first inequality is tight. Okay. So the remainder of today's lecture, I want to show you how to prove Shoi Moshi's lower bound. And it has some similarities to uh, the one that we've seen because it also looks at some geometric uh, aspects of the sum product problem but it doesn't use uh, the exact tools that we've seen earlier. It does use some tools that were related to the lecture from yesterday, from, from Monday. Uh, so last time we discussed this thing called the additive energy. 
you can come up with a similar notion for the multiplication operation, right? so the multiplicative energy. Multiplicative energy, which we'll denote by E okay, sub, so with the uh, multiplication symbol A. So the multiplicative energy is like the additive energy, except that instead of doing addition, we're going to do multiplication instead. So one way to define it is it's the number of quadruples such that there exists some some real lambda such that a comma b equals to lambda c comma d. Okay. Okay, so basically the same as additive energy except that we're using multiplications instead. By the cauchy schwarz inequality, and this is an inequality uh, this is a calculation we saw last time as well. We see that if you have a set with small product, then it must have high multiplicative energy. So last time we saw if you have st small sum set implies high additive energy. Likewise, small, pro small product set implies high multiplicative energy. In particular, the multiplicative energy of A, you can rewrite it as the sum over all elements x in the product set of the quantity, which tells you the number of ways to write x as a product, this number squared, and then summed over all x. By cauchy schwartz we find that this quantity here is lower bounded by the size of a to the fourth divided by the size of a times a. So to prove Shoimoshi's theorem, we are going to actually prove a bound on the energy. Instead of proving it on the product set, we're going to prove it on the energy. So to, it suffices to show that the multiplicative energy is at most four times the sum set size times, well, okay, so let me divide the energy by log of A. So you can plug this into this inequality, you would imply the theorem. So it remains to show this inequality over here, upper bounding the multiplicative energy. There's an important idea um, that we're going to use here, which is also pretty common in analysis, is that instead of considering that energy sum here, we're going to consider okay, so a similar sum, except we're going to chop up the sum into pieces according to how big the terms are, so that we're only looking at contributions of comparable size. And so this is called a dyadic decomposition. Um, the idea is that we can write the multiplicative energy similar to above, but instead of summing over x in the product set, let me sum over s in the quotient set. Okay, so you can interpret what this a um, quotient A is, so this is the set of all A divided by B, where A and B are in A. A is a set of positive reals, so I don't need to worry about division by zero. So what remains then is the intersection of S times A and A squared. Okay, so remember, S times A is scaling each element of A by S have this quantity over here. So I want to break up the sum into a bunch of smaller sums where in, I want to break up the sum according to how big the terms are. So that inside each group, all the terms are roughly of the same size. 
and I, the easiest way to do this is to chop them up into um, groups where everything inside the same collection uh, differs by at most a factor of two. So that's why it's called a dyadic decomposition. So going from i from zero to the maximum possible here is basically a. So let's look at i going from zero to log base two of a. So this is the number of bins. And each and, and partition the sum into subsums where I'm looking at the ith subsum consisting of contributions involving terms with size between two to the i and two to the i plus one. Okay, so break up the sum according to the sizes of the summons. By pigeonhole principle, one of these summons must be somewhat large. So by pigeonhole, there exists a K such that the setting D to be the S's such that um, that corresponds to, yeah, so the kth term in the sum So one has that this sum coming from just contributions from D is at least, um, okay, so it's at least the multiplicative energy divided by the number of bins. That many bins, I, by pigeonhole, I can find one bin that has a pretty large contribution to the sum. On the right-hand side, we can upper bound each term in this, um, each term over here by two to the two k plus two, and the number of terms is the size of d. Okay. Let me call the elements of d s1 through sm. So where S1 through SM are sorted in increasing order. Okay. Now let me draw you a picture of what's going on. Let's consider for each element of D, Okay, so for each i in M, let's consider the line given by the equation y equals to s sub i times x. So let me draw this picture where I'm looking at the positive quadrant. So I have a bunch of points in the positive quadrant. And specifically, I'm interested in these points whose coordinates, both coordinates are elements of A. And I want to consider lines through points of A. But I want to consider lines where it intersects this A cross A in the desired number of points. And you know, we find those set, and then let's draw these lines over here, where this line here, L1, it has slope exactly S1, and then L2, L3, and so on. Okay. I want to draw one more line, which is um, somewhat auxiliary, but just to make our life a bit easier. Um, finally, let's let 
L of m plus 1 be the vertical line, or rather be the vertical ray, um, which goes through the minimum element of A above um, Lm. So it's this line over here. That's Lm plus 1. Okay, so I, in A cross A, I draw a bunch of lines. Right, so not all the lines, so all these lines involve some point of A and the origin, but I don't draw all of them. I draw a select set of them. And what we said earlier says that the number of lines, the number of points on each of these strong lines is roughly the same for each of these lines. Okay, let's let capital L sub J denote the set of points in A cross A that lie on the jth line. So that's L1, L2, and so on. I claim that if you look at two consecutive lines and look at the sum set of the points in A cross A that they intersect, okay, well, you're looking at two lines and you're adding up points on those two lines. So you form a grid. So you end up forming this grid. And the number of points on this grid is precisely the product of these two point sets. Moreover, the sets Lj plus L sub j plus 1 are disjoint for a different j. And this is okay, so this is where we're using the geometry of the plane here. Because the sum of L1 and L2 lies in this span. The sum of L2 and L3 lies in a different span. So they cannot intersect. Right? So they lie in okay, so, so they, since they span disjoint regions. So, okay, so L1 plus L2 lies here, L2 plus L3 lies there, and so on. So they're all disjoint. Okay. Now let's put everything that we know together. Remember, the goal is to upper bound the multiplicative energy in, as, as a function of the sum set. So in other words, we want to lower bound the sum set. So I want to show you that this A plus A has a lot of elements. Okay? It has a lot of sums. And I have a bunch of disjoint contributions to these sums. So let's add up those disjoint contributions to the sums. You see that the size of A plus A squared it's the same as the size of the product set A plus A. Okay, so this is Cartesian product. Okay, so here is okay, so this is Cartesian product. So in other words, the grid that is drawn up there. I add this product to itself. Okay, so I should get the same set here. 
Well, how big is this sum set? Right? So that grid, that lattice grid added to itself, how big should it be? I want to lower bound the number of sums. And the key observation is that up there, we can look at contributions coming from distinct spans. So in particular, this sum here, so this uh, sum set here, size is lower bounded by these distinct Lj plus Lj plus ones. Okay, I throw away a lot. I only keep the lines on the Ls, and I only consider sums between consecutive Ls. That should be a lower bound to the sum set of the grid with itself. But you see, okay, and here we're using that these different for different j's, these contributions are disjoint. But by what we said up there, Lj plus Lj plus one is a grid, so it has size Lj times Lj plus one. And the size of each Lj is at least 2 to the k. So the sum here is at least m times 2 to the 2k. But we saw over here that the energy lower bounds this 2 to the 2k. So we have a lower bound that is the multiplicative energy of A divided by four times the log base two of the size of A. Okay, so don't worry so much about the constant factors. It's just the order of magnitude that is important. And that's it. Yep. How do we know that the size of big L sub M plus one? Ah, okay. Great. The question is how do we what do we know about the size of big L sub M plus one? Okay, so that's a good point. Um, Easiest answer is if I don't care about these constant factors, I don't need to worry about it. Right? But I, you can think about what, the, what is the number of points on this line um, above that. Okay, so I mean, it's essentially the number of elements of A above the biggest element of um, SM, uh, above SM. Yes, the, it's a good question. Uh, I think we don't need to worry about it, so I'm being slightly sloppy here. Yeah. Right, so I think the question is, how do we know, you know for j equals to m that you have this bound over here? Ah, great, okay, so, yeah. So. Oh, okay, yeah. Make, like, an L0 as well. Like, like, on the bottom. Okay, so there's some ways to do it. Like, you can notice that the vertical line has at least as many points as the first um, uh, slanted line. Anyway, so I, details that you can work on. Okay, so this proves Shoei-Moshi's theorem, which gives you a lower bound on the uh, sum set and the product set sizes, so the maximum of those two. I see it's based on, it's, it's very short, it's very clever, it took a long time to find, um, and it gave a bound on the sum product problem of four thirds that actually remain stuck for a very long time um, until just fairly recently um, there was a improvement that gives, um, so by Konyagin and Shkredov, where they improved the showing Moshi bound from four-thirds to four-thirds plus some really small constant C. So it's some explicit constant 
Um, I think right now, so that's being improved over time, but right now I think C is around one over a thousand or a few thousands. So it's some small but explicit constant. Okay. It remains a major open problem to improve this bound and prove Erder's similarity conjecture that if you have n elements, then one of the sums or products must be nearly quadratic in size. And people generally believe that that's the case. Any questions? Okay. So, so this concludes all the topics I want to cover in this course. So we went a long way. So at the beginning of this course, we started with extremal graph theory, looking at the basic problem of if you have a graph that doesn't contain some subgraph, triangle, C4, what's the maximum number of edges? In fact, that showed up even today. And then we went on to other tools like Semiradi's regularity lemma that allows us to deduce important arithmetic consequences such as Roth's theorem. It's also an extremal problem if you have a set without a three-term arithmetic progression, how many elements can it have? And so the important tool of Semiradi's regularity lemma then later showed up in many different ways in this course, uh, especially the message of Semiradi's regularity lemma, that when you look at an object, it's important to decompose it into its structured component and its pseudo-random component. Right, so this dichotomy, this interplay between structure and pseudo-randomness is a key theme throughout this course. And it showed up in some of the later topics as well when we discussed spectral graph theory, quasi-randomness, uh, graph limits, and also in the later Fourier analytic proof of Ross theorem. As in all of these proofs, all of these techniques involve some kind of interplay between structure and pseudo-randomness. In the past month or so, we've been looking at Freiman's theorem, um, this key result in additive combinatorics concerning the structure of sets under addition. And there, we also saw many different tools that came up um, and also connections I mentioned uh, a few lectures ago, connections to really important results in geometry to you know, group theory, and it really extends all around. And a few takeaways from this course, you know, one of it is that graph theory, additive combinatorics, they're not isolated subjects. They're connected to a lot within mathematics. And that's one of the goals I want to show you in this course, is to show you these connections throughout mathematics and uh, some to analysis, to geometry, to topology, and uh, even simple questions can lead to really deep mathematics. And some of them I try to show you, try to hint at you, or at least I mentioned throughout this course. And you know, what we've seen so far and is just the tip of the iceberg. Right? So, and there's a lot of still extremely exciting work that's been done. And I've also tried to emphasize many important open problems that yet, yet to be better understood. And I expect that in some future iteration of this course, um, some of these problems will be resolved and I can show the next generation of students in your seats some new techniques, new methods, and new theorems. And I expect that will be the case. This is a very exciting area. And so the area that is very close to my heart is something that I've been thinking about uh, you know, since my PhD. You know, this is bulk of my research work revolves around better understanding connections between graph theory on one hand and additive combinatorics on the other hand. It's been really fun teaching this course and happy to have all of you here. Thank you.